All right, good afternoon, everybody. I wanna welcome you to this week's seminar for the Western Center for Agricultural Health and Safety. And before we get into the talks proper, we have a few housekeeping items to address. Just to let you all know, uh, this seminar is being recorded and accordingly, everybody's going to be muted uh, throughout the presentation. If you do have questions to ask, we request that you use the chat function. We'll be accumulating all the questions at the end and then we'll go through them with the speakers. Reminder that Spanish interpretation is available and you can select your interpretation option from the menu below in the Zoom interface. And also closed captioning is available and you can select that using the closed captioned icon in the Zoom interface. So we're pleased to have uh, two speakers today who will be talking about the agricultural use of 1,3-dichloropropene and associated re uh, respiratory emergency department visits in certain California communities from 2013 to 2017. You'll be hearing from two experts in the field, Dr. Jing Tao, who is a research scientist with the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment at the California EPA, as well as Dr. Robert Gagné, an assistant researcher with the UC uh, Berkeley School of Public Health. So with that, I'd like to welcome our speakers and pass things over to them. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for your introduction, Chris. Um, so as he said, my name is Bob Gagné and I'm at the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley. And I was gonna start off by presenting on a study we did looking at 1,3-dichloropropene use and respiratory health in the Chamacos study. And this helped um, generate interest for the study that um, we're currently working on that Jim will present next. So our research question was, does residential proximity to the use of 1,3-dichloropropene either during pregnancy or childhood affect respiratory health in school-aged children. A little background on 1,3-dichloropropene, um, also referred to as 1,3-D or T-lone. It's a fumigant that's used to sterilize soil before planting, and it's one of the most highly used pesticides in California. Um, 12 to 16 million pounds per year, that applied annually between 2014 and 2018, the most recent years that uh, data are available. And it's considered one of the replacements for methyl bromide, which is being phased out. It's mostly applied on strawberries and potatoes pre-planting, but also on fruit and nut trees. Um, exposure to 1,3-D occurs because it's a volatile gas with about a quarter to half of the applications emitted into the air within two weeks of application, which results in exposure to surrounding communities. It's also a respiratory irritant and one of the highest ranked uh, inhalation risks based on a risk assessment conducted um, in 2002. There are not biomarkers that are readily available for 1,3-D exposure in environmental exposure levels. Um, there is air monitoring data available in California at 14 different sites. It's been going on for about the last 10 years. And studies have shown that air concentrations at these monitors are related to nearby use. So use can serve as a proxy for exposure. Um, in California, we have a great database called the Pesticide Use Report data that's maintained by the Department of Pesticide Regulation. And it's required full reporting since 1990, which is mandatory for all agricultural and commercial pesticide applications. And applicators have to report the active ingredient, the amount that they apply, the application date, and the location of these applications to a square mile section. So the map on the right shows these square mile sections and they're in different colors depending on how much pesticide was used in that section, with white being no use and yellow low through red being higher use. And then the dot in the middle there is, represents a residence and the circles drawn around the residence are 
buffer distances of one and three kilometers. So what we would do for this study um, for fumigants, which um, are known to travel quite far from the application sites, we looked at buffers of three to eight kilometers, three, five, and eight kilometers. And we intersected these with the section, the square mile sections with the reported use and calculated the use proportional to the area within that buffer. So if all the section fell within the buffer, we would get the full amount of use. But if only half of the section, then we would uh, multiply the use by half. Uh, we also used data from the nearest weather station to look at the percentage of time the residence was downwind from applications. And we summed all these uses um, for each participant over their different residences during pregnancy and also from birth until seven years of age. So our participants are from the Chamacos cohort study, which is located in the Salinas Valley of California. It's often been referred to as the salad bowl of the United States. I believe more than half of all salad produced in the US and consumed in the US is produced in the Salinas Valley. Participants were eligible if they were pregnant, over 18 years of age, and they spoke English or Spanish. We're also Medi-Cal eligible and plan to deliver at the local hospital in the Salinas Valley. We enrolled the pregnant mothers from 1999 through 2001, and we had a total of 601 pregnant moms. So it turns out that the Salinas Valley is a pretty good study location for looking at fumigant use. Um, you can see, again, the red dots indicate higher fumigant use. And the Salinas Valley is here next to Monterey Bay um, and has some of the highest fumigant use in the state, along with other coastal communities down in Santa Barbara and Ventura. And then there's also widespread use in the Central Valley, although not as at high of an intensity as along the coast. For analyses, we looked at outcomes that were assessed when the children were seven years old. We had, from questionnaire data, we had respiratory symptoms and asthma medication as reported by the mothers. And then we did spirometry testing on the seven-year-olds and we measured their forced expiratory volume in one second, their forced vital capacity and forced expiratory flow, which are three common measures of lung function. For the 1,3-D exposures, we log transform the use because there's quite a wide range from less than one pound up to thousands of pounds near the residences. We sum that use within eight kilometers of the residences during pregnancy and from birth to the seven-year assessment. And then for the Respiratory symptoms and asthma medication, we use logistic regression models. And for the spirometry outcomes we looked at, we used linear regression models. We adjusted these models for lots of different potential confounders. Um, for the asthma medication and respiratory symptoms, we did the these various covariates here, maternal smoking, season of birth, uh, mold in the home, and having a runny nose without a cold. And for the spirometry outcomes, we adjusted for the second set of covariates here. It's quite an extensive list, but um, I would say that the results from the unadjusted models were similar to the adjusted models. So including these covariates didn't make any big changes in our results. So the results for the respiratory symptoms and asthma medication are presented in this table. And the first row shows the relationship with prenatal 1,3-D use within eight kilometers. And what this is saying is that the odds of having respiratory symptoms increase 10% with every 10-fold increase in 1,3-D use within eight kilometers. But the confidence intervals here, 0 0.8 to 1.4, and the p-value suggest that this finding is not significantly elevated, not statistically significant, with a p-value of 0.05. Um, 
So you can see the respiratory symptoms with the postnatal use from birth to seven years, slightly higher, but also not significant. The only outcome here that was really close to significant was prenatal use and asthma medication, which had a odds ratio of 1.3 um, and a p-value of 0.17. We had a similar odds ratio with postnatal use, but a much wider confidence interval. So suggesting we didn't have as much statistical power to evaluate this relationship. Our results for lung function are shown in this graph with the prenatal residential proximity to 1,3-D in the black circle dots and the postnatal use in the white circle dots. And the uh, whisker plot shows the 95% confidence intervals around those estimates. So you can see really prenatal use was associated Closest to being significant was the FEF 25 to 75th percentile. Um, and all of the lung function parameters were below zero, which indicates decreased lung function, but none of them were significant. With the postnatal 1,3-D use, all of the estimates were close to zero and none of them were uh, close to significant. So we didn't see much of a relationship there. So just a few discussion items. Um, like all studies, we had limitations. The pesticide use data is, a, is proximity. It's, a, it's not an, a direct measure of personal exposure. Um, we also had a small sample size, which limited our power to detect associations. Um, for example, with the asthma medications and the prenatal 1,3-D use, that's a 30% increase in asthma medication use, which is quite high, but um, our sample size was not large enough to be able to detect this as a significant association. Some of the strengths of our study is that it's a very well characterized prospective cohort that was followed from birth through seven years of age. Uh, the exposure estimates are unbiased, meaning they weren't self-reported by the uh, participants. These are just uh, data that's mandatory and reported statewide. And the pesticide use reported data allowed us to assess critical periods of exposure like prenatal and lifetime, early childhood. So that's another strength. Um, so this, this study was published in 2018 in environmental research. And here's the uh, citation and my email here at the bottom if you would like a copy or have any questions since you've taken a look at that. So I'd like to thank our Chamacos participants and our staff in the Salinas field office for conducting all the questionnaires and spirometry measurements. Um, other collaborators here at UC Berkeley are Brenda Eskenazi, who's the principal investigator on the Chamacos study, John Baums, who's our um, respiratory uh, medical doctor and expert in this field. Asa Bradman and Kim Harley and Rosemary Castorina who have been involved in Chamacos for a long time and helped collect the data and help me with the analysis. And our funding is from the NIEHS and also the US EPA funded by these grants listed. So questions, I guess if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll try to address those at the end of the presentation. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.
Uh, hello, hi, this is Jing Tao, and thanks Bob for the presentation. I thank Western Center for Agriculture, Health and Safety for inviting us to present our pilot study, Agricultural Use of 1-3-D and Respiratory Emergency Department Visits in Selected California Communities from 2013 to 2017. As Chris introduced, I'm a research scientist in OIHA, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment under Cal EPA. I'd like to start with a brief introduction of our multidisciplinary team on this project. Uh, as a research scientist of OIHA pesticide epidemiology section, I mainly worked on exposure evaluation of pesticide uses. Before I joined OIHA two years ago, I had 10 years working experience in Department of Pesticide Regulation on L dispersion modeling for pesticide uses and data analysis of pesticide L concentrations. Uh, two OIHA epidemiologists, Dr. Xiangmei Wu and Dr. Keita Abisu in air and the climate epidemiology section are experts on epidemiology of air pollution. They have been helping us review the study design and extract the human health data. Uh, we started this project last summer. David Cornell, a Berkeley MPH student at that time, was our intern and conducted a spatial analysis of the pesticide use data. Uh, this summer, another MPH student and intern, Judy Tan, continued to work on the project. Uh, over this year, Dr. Gunian helped us apply for funding, help students, and review the analysis. Uh, as Dr. Cunha introduced, uh, soil fumigation is used to sterilize soil before uh, planting. Uh, the fumigant is applied with and or without tarp. For both scenarios, the gas disperses through soil first, then volatilizes into the atmosphere and travels to the nearby communities. Uh, many factors can affect this process, such as soil characteristics, tarp type, weather conditions, and so on. Uh, 1-3-D is one of the most highly used fumigants in California. Uh, there are limited 1-3-D exposure data. Uh, Department of Pesticide Regulation has long-term air monitoring programs in several locations of California as shown in this map. Uh, these sites do not stay the same over years. Air monitoring network for multiple pesticides uh, including 1-3-D, started with three sites in 2011. The number of sites increased in recent years, uh, shown as the blue site on this map. Uh, but this site significantly dropped last year due to the pandemic. The program are resuming all the sites this year. Uh, there is also a 1-3-D monitoring study with two sites shown as gray on the map. At all of the sites, uh, the monitoring is not continuous. Uh, is conducted for a 24-hour period every week, and the detection is less than 50% uh, in many sites. Uh, in addition, although some studies indicated a uh, respiratory health impact of 1-3-D, uh, literature review showed the limited studies really on the health effects of short-term exposure uh, to the soil fumigants. So uh, our question is that if the use of 1-3-D causes the acute exposure of population in the nearby communities, consequently cause possible increase of respiratory emergency department visits at EDV. Um, and the second question is if we uh, can build a relationship on the pesticide use data, um, not like uh, exposure data, California has the most comprehensive pesticide use reporting system. The state government uses to check and regulate the pesticide use in California. So if we can find the association between a health outcome and the 1-3-D use data, it will help the state improve the pesticide management. So Dr. Gunia has talked about the PUR data, I will just talk a little bit about how we use it in our study. So first, we use the PUR data to select study communities. Uh, then we also use it as an exposure indicator in our analysis. 
uh, we understand that the pesticide application cannot accurately represent daily pest, pesticide exposure. So, uh, because after application, one 3 d emission can last for days to weeks. A lot of factors, as we mentioned, could affect the emission and dispersion of one 3 d in the ambient air. Uh, so the same amount of application could result in various uh, exposure of the communities. Uh, this is one of the biggest challenges of the study. Uh, for human health outcome in communities, we use the emergency department visits data obtained from the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. Uh, this data provides individual patient records such as zip code, service date, diagnosis, and some other information. Uh, OEHA Air and the Climate Epidemiology Section has successfully used this data to study the acute and the chronic health impact of air pollutants and climate change and has published several uh, journal articles. Uh, since we have the data and expertise in-house, we thought why not extend the research to pesticides. Uh, although later we realized that without similar types of exposure data, we cannot simply uh, just apply the similar epidemiology method. Okay, uh, here's our uh, data processing and exploratory analysis results. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we selected the study communities based on the pesticide use data. Uh, PR data is publicly available on the DPR's FTP site as zip file of county use tables in each year. Uh, this slide will show our procedure to process it. Uh, firstly, we developed an R function that can automatically download, import, process, and merge PR data in R. Uh, the function output data at CSV files uh, with spatial identifiers that is readable to ArcGIS. We upload the output files to ArcGIS and join in the use table with other geographic information so we can make maps to visualize the data. Also, uh, we union all township sections that has pesticide uses, created a five mile buffer along the use area and identify the whole area as a potential exposure area. We then overlay the exposure area with community map at zip code level. Uh, finally, we identify the study communities as zip code tabulation areas, also called ZIGTAS based on certain selection condition, which I will talk about next. Uh, for our study, we select dictas based on pesticide use pattern of a five year period from 2013 to 2017. Our selection is not just based on one 3 d use. We want to control the community's exposure to other highly used fumigants and eliminate their health impact in our analysis. So we select the ZIGTAS that has one 3 d use within five miles, but do not have uses of other major fumigants. Uh, this selection resulted in 52 ZIGTAS in uh, California as shown on the map. Uh, we summarized the 1,3-D uses around these sectors and found that they have different use pattern. Uh, four adjacent sectors in Santa Cruz had the most frequent 1,3-D uses among 52 sectors, which I will talk about on the next few slides. This is a summary of 1,3-D uses of 52 sectors. There were total uh, 390 applications within five miles of selected sectors from 2013 to 2017. Over 50% of the of applications were around the four Santa Cruz sectors that I showed in the previous slide. Uh, among the rest of 48 sectors, seven of them have 12 to 31 applications during five years, and 41 sectors had less than 10 applications over five years. Those sectors also showed a very different seasonality of uh, one 3 d uses. The figure, uh, this figure plus the daily use amount of one 3 d around the four Santa Cruz sectors from 2013 to 2017. In this area, most of one 3 d was applied every year uh, between April and June. 
Uh, there were also a limited number of applications in late fall and early spring. Uh, because of these four dictates are next to each other, a lot of applications were within five miles of more than one dictate. So some bars on different dicta panels in this figure actually represent the same applications. Uh, however, other 48 dictates in our selection do not show the same pattern. Uh, they could have one or two applications every year, or have one or more applications in one year, but did not have one CD use in all the other years. Therefore, uh, we exported the data of uh, four Santa Cruz dictates and uh, the rest of the 48 dictates with different methods. Uh, we extracted the emergency department with data for all the dictates. We filtered data with respiratory outcomes of concern, uh, which are acute respiratory disease, asthma, and obstructive pulmonary disease. We firstly aggregated data on daily basis at the dicta level. Uh, due to low case counts, we then actually have to aggregate data on higher spatial and temporal levels. Um, we summarized the daily case count for about a total 95,000 dicta days and found 66% of days uh, at 52 dictas over five years do not have any concerned uh, respiratory emergency department visits. And the less than 0.1% days have higher than uh, 10 case counts. The low case count uh, means not only low data variation, but also a problem for the data presentation. Uh, due to the protection of human subjects, we cannot bring out the data with less than 10, uh, uh, less than 10 cases from confidential HIPAA computer and present here. Okay, then let's see some exploratory analysis results. Um, uh, first, I'm showing you the time series of bi-weekly uh, EDV cases and the 1CD applications of four Santa Cruz dictas together. Uh, EDV data also shows strong seasonality, but the pattern is very different from 1CD uses. Uh, respiratory visits were constantly high in winter, then decreased during spring and reaches the lowest number in summer. A two weeks period has a um, missing case count on this plot because it had less than, uh, less than 10 cases. For the rest of 48 dictas, uh, because of low application counts and the low case count in many dictas, uh, we aggregate data of all uh, 48 dictas dictates together, uh, we calculated total uh, EDV cases on, other, on each day of 1 to 14 days before and uh, 0 to 13 days after 1-3D applications and presented the data on this plot. This plot also did not show any higher counts of respiratory visits after 1-3D applications. So basically, we did not see any visible relationship between 1-3D applications and the respiratory EDV cases in exploratory analysis. But we observed a strong seasonality in the respiratory related visits. This needs to be controlled for our further analysis in the study. Uh, we also consider some other uh, potential impact factors of respiratory uh, respiratory cases such as PM 2.5 and the weather conditions. We used the US EPA modeling results and calculated uh, population weighted average concentration of PM 2.5 at Zikta level. As for weather data, we used the Siemens data and got the daily average of temperature, wind speed, precipitation, and humidity. As we expected, PM 2.5 uh, showed some uh, positive relationship with respiratory uh, EDV cases. 
This plot shows the data of four Santa Cruz sectors, as shown in the plot the PM2.5 was high in 2013 to 2015 winters and may have contributed to the EDV peaks in those winters. However, it seems not related to the EDV uh, high numbers in 2016 and 2017 winters. Winters, uh, so the effect of PM two point five could be more complicated than we thought. Uh, temperature seems like the best predictor of respiratory uh, EDV case counts so far. Uh, EDV case count has a constantly inverse relationship with the temperature, as shown on this plot. Uh, For our next step, we have been working on various uh, epidemiology analysis methods. Um, we now consider finding some communities around Santa Cruz County that has similar population, but do not have the fumigant uses. So we can use them as a control area to be compared with the four Santa Cruz sectors. And we also consider case crossover study design since it would be very useful uh, for our low case count situation. But case crossover study requires daily exposure data, so the use data may not be uh, appropriate uh, uh, for this type of the study design. Uh, as, so as estimating 1,3D daily exposure level with air dispersion modeling may be necessary to conduct the case crossover. Um, last but not least, we would like to develop more collaboration. Uh, if you are interested in this project, have any feedback for us or knows anyone like graduate students looking for research project like this, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, we look forward to working with more young talents interested in environmental health of California. Uh, okay, uh, thanks for listening. Um, uh, our project is partially funded by the rap rapid response funding of the Western Center uh, for Agriculture, Health and Safety, and thank the Center again for the support and the presentation opportunities. Uh, I guess now we are ready for the questions. Great, I want to thank you both for your presentation today. And we do have a few questions in the comments that I'm happy to relay to you. The first question relates to Dr. Gagne's presentation, and it was asking about the process for determining the diameter of the assessment areas. That's a very good question. So what we did, we looked at, um, or we, use the distance that was based on air monitoring studies um, of other fumigants and what distances from those air monitors best predicted the measured concentrations there. And it turned out to be um, the use within a township, which is a six by six grid of those um, square mile sections. So that ends up being about five miles as being used or that's the same as eight kilometers, basically. So that was the, the most predictive distance um, for measured air concentrations. We did also try three and five kilometers to see if it was relationships differed by that distance. Thank you. We had another question asking, uh, what are the alternative fumigants and what would growers have available to them in order to protect their crops from nematodes? Um, well, I know I can answer about other fumigants. Um, the two other, uh, as I said earlier, methyl bromide is being phased out um, and almost down to zero use in California now. And that's because of ozone depletion in the stratosphere. Um, but there are other fumigants, um, including chloropicrin is one, and um, another is metam sodium or other related compounds that end up producing MITC as the active fumigant ingredient. Um, the issue is, is that those also have some toxic properties and are also respiratory irritants. So um, as is often the case in um, pesticide use, you have to be careful not to 
um, replace one bad acting pesticide with just another pesticide that we don't yet know what its toxic properties are. So, uh, I don't know if you have anything, Jean, to add to that. Since you're... I think I have, I have uh, not many things to add. I think that's right. Because fumigant is actually a serious, highly used the first site in California and have uh, some uh, health concerns. So uh, I don't think we have um, the state of uh, state government have been working to trying to regulate and actually better manage the use of the fumigants. So I don't think we have more alternatives. Um, at this moment. Yeah, I guess I would just add that, you know, it is possible to produce these same crops organically. And, you know, there's organic strawberries, organic potatoes um, available in the markets. They cost more, so the production yield is lower and the loss due to pests is higher, but it is possible to produce perfectly good food without using any fumigants. Thank you. There's a follow-up question for Dr. Tao. Would you provide more details about processing the raw pesticide use reporting data for GIS use? And is that our package publicly available? Uh, we actually don't use any R packages. So uh, our student, uh, David Cornell, as I introduced last summer. So basically, uh, he and me work together. We de develop our own R functions, can automatically download and process and merge PR data. So whoever actually is interested in using the, this function actually can reach out to us and I can share our function and uh, to can uh, process in the PR data and uh, use it for the ArcGIS. Great, thank you. Another question, do you believe other areas of California further from the ocean could be more likely to correlate with EDVs? Uh, we actually believe so. I think um, one of the challenging uh, in this study in the beginning because we select the communities uh, based on one city use, but also want to control the use of the other uh, fumigants. So actually by this selection, we actually excluded a lot of the area that uh, has the highly one city uses, but also have a lot of other fumigant uses. So our preliminary uh, results is only in the of the results of the selected communities that show the uh, obvious relationship between the uh, one city use and the EDV visits, but it's possibly in those highly used areas that's still possible that they have some certain type of relationship. But uh, the difficulties is how we can actually um, analyze those type of relationship first to can uh, separate the one 3 d impact with other uh, fumigants. And uh, another thing is uh, it's possible they also have some cumulative impact of the one 3 d and the other fumigants together. So, but I guess we need to have more time and more talents to work together to figure those out, how to do analysis for those areas. Perfect lead into the next question, which was, are you considering looking at all fumigants together and their cumulative impact? And it sounds like that is something that you're contemplating and working towards. Yes, we we wanted to do those type of analysis, but just uh, need time to find out the best method to do it. Certainly. We have another question in the comments saying, I was surprised to see the lack of correlation between PM 2.5 and wintertime ED visits on the coast. This seems to be the opposite of the San Joaquin Valley, which imposes strict winter burning restrictions. This is tangential to the topic, but is anyone looking at the regional specificity of PM 2.5 and EDV? Yeah, as, as I mentioned, that we saw that the, actually we, all of us believe the positive relationship between the PM 2.5 and the uh, EDV visits. It's just the, 
uh, it seems like our data showed is more than just simply uh, linear regression uh, in all the area during all the time. It has sometimes could have some other factors uh, working there and uh, make different contribution. And regarding methods, we have a question that says, is it possible to control for the use method? For example, uh, bare soil, standard tarp, use of TIF or VIF in order to estimate mm -hmm. emissions. Yeah, actually, originally we really liked to, to have those in our uh, analysis, but as I show, in the, some exploratory uh, results that we really have low case counts and the low application in a lot of the communities that we selected. That make, if we actually separate them to by the application method, that's, it's possible based on the PR data application method. And uh, I'm not sure if we can find the soil characteristics of all those uh, communities. I guess if, if, even if those methods, we may not have enough data variation to really do this type of analysis. So um, I guess the best if we figure out a way in the future to do the analysis for the highly used area and, uh, and with uh, multiple things together, maybe we have some way can also in those area can do, can consider those factors in our analysis. Hope so. I just hope so. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, we've reached the end of the questions. Uh, I'll give a few moments in case anybody wants to add to that. I'll add one question of my own. Uh, thinking back, I think there was some work looking at 1.3D exposure from 2005 to 2011 mm -hmm. that was able to suss out uh, correlation between exposure and EDV visits. Um, do you think that has something to do with the nature of fumigant use in years past? Was there more use or was the blend of fumigants uh, such that, that maybe 1,3-D exposure was a proxy for some other type of exposure that led to increased EDVs? Oh, just a question for me. Because uh, for, for everybody, for, for yeah. both of you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, because I heard you mention 2005 to 2013, that's previous. Oh yes, this is uh, work, work uh, with another group. I think it was out of UC Merced. Oh. Um, yeah, and I think they used uh, the air monitoring data, um, which um, it kind of limits somewhat the study area you can do. Mm -hmm. because as we said, there are only 14 air monitor, air monitoring stations that measure 1,3D. But it is also probably a better measure of exposure than trying to summarize the use. You have actual measured concentrations. But um, I believe that same group also published some other papers on looking at other fumigants, um, other air pollutants, I think ozone um, and NO2. So I think it does also kind of come back to this, looking at the, the entire mixture of exposures, you know, PM 2.5, mm -hmm. and using, you know, I guess more sophisticated statistical methods to try to tease apart the cumulative impact, but also what the individual components are contributing. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I want to echo a lot of the comments, uh, just saying that the presentations were fantastic, and thank you for taking the time to describe your work today. Um, for me personally, as somebody working and developing fumigation alternatives, it's really valuable to have these insights um, and always looking to point towards studies that can give a fair representation of what chronic exposure to these popular fumigants entails. Uh, so thank you again. And uh, with that, I think we can conclude the seminar and thank you for the audience for attending today. Okay, thank yeah. you, bye.